Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Daniel Lacare and Ira Harris. Daniel holds a PhD in economics and is chief economist at Tresis has been ranked in the top 20 most influential economists in the world. He's the author of several books, including most recently Escape from the Central Bank Trap and Freedom or Equality. Ira is an independent trader, hedge fund manager, global macro consultant, trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He was also CME director from 1997 to 2003, and also most recently, Welcome, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Richard. Great. I uh, thought we'd begin with a discussion on the European Central Bank. Uh, Daniel, uh, what do you make of, of your thoughts on their uh, move to a more uh, rigid yield curve control policy? Is this intended to reduce the burden of debt through financial repression? What are your thoughts? Yes, I think that what the European Central Bank uh, is is moving into is uh, trying to do yield curve control because they've uh, basically exhausted all other tools. No, you look at uh, the European Central Bank's policies in the last five years: negative rates done. Uh, massive quantitative easing done, uh, direct repurchase of uh, both uh, uh, investment grade bonds and uh, 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 government uh, assets done. So basically the European Central Bank finds itself stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one side, it cannot normalize policy because what uh, you would see is that as you saw in the past two weeks, is that the slightest move in sovereign bond yields can generate a very big impact on uh, the, the landscape, both of the economy and markets, is that bond yields, sovereign bond yields are so massively uh, and artificially depressed that um, uh, the slightest move creates a big problem. So it's, it's caught in that situation. Uh, the ECB right now is, is more than 100% of um, sovereign bonds net issuances. And that means that there is no market. So, uh, so what they're trying now to do is to um, manage the curve in order to avoid inflationary pressures generating uh, a slump in inequity and bond markets. And your thoughts, Ira? Well, I, I think Daniel's points are very well taken, and it's you know the European view, which is, uh, yeah, you know, you. I, I was watching yesterday, so as long as we're talking about Europe, we we have Lagarde, who is certainly reading I, him, uh, her, and. Um, um, Powell are certainly locked arm in arm along with Yellen, you know, they have Yellen too, and uh, there's a relationship between, of course, Lagarde and Yellen for years. So they're all pushing the same. And I would, I think that, you know, because of the nature of the European bond market, it being uh, for the ECB anyway, 19 variables, because they have so many different bonds that they buy to, uh, to meet the requirements that they've set for themselves with their quantitative easing, they're really de- doing yield curve control because even Lagarde keeps talking about uh, that, well, on a day-to-day basis, it's not an issue of, of really a capital key because they'll override it if they need to, if certain countries' uh, uh, bonds may be under uh, uh, pressure that they, you know, and they're not going to tell you how much they're buying and they'll violate the capital key. And, and that's an issue of flows. That's what Draghi used to talk about. Yes, flows versus stock. At the end of a period of time, they'll smooth it out and they'll always, quote unquote, always 
adhered to the capital key. But uh, the United States has a more difficult role because they can't surreptitiously do yield curve control. They're going to have to tell the market that they're doing yield curve control. And of course, we saw uh, some of that uh, yesterday, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that as it evolves. But in following up with Daniel, uh, last week we saw the elections out of Germany mm -hmm. or over the weekend. And interestingly, that uh, the official Monetary Financial Institutions Forum, which was, I think, put together by David Marsh, who is, I mean, back in the 90s, I read his book on the Bundesbank, which was really enlightening for me and is really knowledgeable. But even uh, he had a piece out on, uh, what's the date? <laughs> I've been in Chicago moving. Okay, so it must have been Monday after the elections. And he had a piece out, heavy losses from Merkel complicate European recovery policies. And that makes it even much more difficult because as he cites, you know, there's more court cases coming. The Germans are not happy. They are not happy. They are suffering. And we're on the financial repression authority. They are truly suffering. Probably the worst case right now in the world of financial repression because it appears that by any measure, inflation is probably in Germany, certainly over a two handle, even though throughout Europe itself, it's not. So with negative, uh, where are we at on the uh, Euribor this morning? Uh, oh, uh, negative 75, uh, I'm sorry, negative 52 base points. So they're, they're only being financially repressed to the tune of about a negative 3% real yield, which is causing yeah. political uncertainty. You know, it's not just the COVID vaccines, it's a lot of things. So everything that Daniel talks about, I, I think is really in play here when it comes to Europe. What, what do you make of the uh, European elections, um, Daniel, like in the, I think the Netherlands also and Germany uh, what are the effects on the European economy and the financial markets do you see? Well, I think that um, the German elections show that uh, it's a much more unstable political environment in Germany than what we tend to see in the media. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for... Uh, the CDU, the German right, uh, center right uh, um, party, to uh, overcome this uh, this loss, and uh, what we're seeing at the same time is that a fragile coalition of the left wing parties would uh, would create a lot more instability, particularly on on important areas of the German economy. Um, we must uh, remember that Germany implemented one of the most aggressive energy uh, transition policies ever seen in history. It's called the Energy Vendor, which is um, which basically uh, erased uh, the nuclear power out of the energy mix uh, to substitute it with uh, renewables. And uh, the result has been uh, pretty phenomenal in terms of negative effect for consumers. In that sense, what we have seen is that Germany now depends more on Russian gas and on <clears throat> lignite, while at the same time, the huge subsidies have almost doubled the household bills. So I think that the situation in Germany much more complicated than what uh, is led to believe. I think that there's a general perception within Europe that no matter what the outcome of a general, of an election in Germany, it's going to be a positive because they seem to get along in uh, important matters, uh, judging by the coalition between the socialist and the center right of the past. But I think it's more fragile this time. In, in the Netherlands, I think it's a very strong message of support to what has been called the frugal position. The position that uh, we saw with uh, at the beginning of the pandemic of the of some of the European northern economies that uh, were quite 
opposed to a massive injection of liquidity and huge deficit spending as a response to the to the pandemic. So I think that uh, it's going to be an interesting process because we we are getting into the approval of the of the European Recovery Fund, which has not yet been implemented. And uh, the, the new administration in the, in the Netherlands is going to be quite, uh, quite vocal about doing things uh, right and not just uh, showering money to uh, peripheral countries to, to waste on anything. And your thoughts, Ira? Well, I, I mean, these are really important things that Daniel's bringing up because, again, it, really what he, what he continues to come to is that this is still much more fragile. Europe is much more fragile. And I've been, and I've been bullish, I, you know, since what I call the, uh, the, uh, when Wolfgang Schweibel, uh, almost a year, it was, uh, I like can March, uh, I'm sorry, May 24th last year when he made the famous, uh, statement, um, uh, and being that he's one of the the grandfathers of uh, especially German frugality and therefore EU frugality. Mm -hmm. But when he made that, his own pivot away, when uh, he talked about the need for helping those under COVID, and he said not with loans, but actually with grants, because he said in that, in that famous comment over the weekend that if you give loans, it's like giving them stones, whereas if you give them grants, and he had talked about 75 billion uh, and uh, what became a far bigger number. Uh, but if you give them grants, it, it's far better. Giving them loans is like just piling more stones on top of them. So I thought that yeah. was an important point. And if we look at that point, that's when the Euro was trading 108 and we I'm talking about to the dollar and we you know, had that you know, sustained rally up to 122. And now yesterday, the Euro, of course, after the Powell, uh, press conference, uh, the euro did get back over 120 for a brief time, but it's a back under pressure today. But yet, you know, and let's see if I'm looking at the, the, the differential uh, between the German Bund and the US Treasury. So we're out almost to this morning, almost to 200 basis points, which is multi-year highs yeah. on the differential. Uh, but yet the, the euro still sits here comfortably at 119 to 120 without much good going on. And that's with the underreporting of some of the political uh, uh, uncertainties building and what could be as uh, uh, I know uh, a lot of people don't like him, but I think uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard wrote a piece, you know, talking about the dilemma for Lagarde with the bond purchases, but that the Germans, there are certain elements within Germany we're coming again to the German high court and saying that there is no mandate hmm. for uh, for the ECB to save the European Union. There's a lot more fragility, but I think it really reflects when you look at the price of the euro, the real questions that the world has about the dollar. So this is all going to come to the surface. And I think Daniel's 100% right. And the German energy policy under Merkel is a cut and paste job that is just terrible. And, and now Germany is gonna run into loggerheads with the US because they're committed to Nord Stream 2, come hell yeah. or high water, whether it's really gonna be needed or not, they are committed to it. Gerhard Schroeder is the linchpin, which the media seems to have always failed to, to mention that he's the chairman of the gas prime pipeline program brought in by Putin. Uh, there's a lot of issues that are on the slow boil here that the markets need to pay attention to. And, I, and Daniel raises them and calls attention to them. And I think it's very critical. Yeah. No, I, I think that one of the things that you've just mentioned, which is uh, the relative stability of the euro, is a very important uh, driver here, is that I think that as long as the European Union into the Eurozone into 2021 is able 
to maintain the level of trade surplus that it enjoys right now, the inflow into the Eurozone of uh, reserves is likely to maintain the Euro within a very tight range relative to the US dollar. I think that that, that, uh, that is uh, correct. I also think that even with the, and, be, and allow me to, to be diplomatic by saying the absolutely disastrous vaccine rollout uh, of the European Union, this is, a, this is a complete nightmare what is happening here. Um, even with that, uh, the, the, there's going to be a recovery and there's going to be a, a, you know, an estimated 4% GDP growth in the Eurozone. So all of that is going to likely maintain the Euro relatively stable unless, and I don't think it's a probability, at least in the, in the near future, unless we started to see and uh, you know messages about breaking up the euro or things like that that I don't think are, sir, are are in the political in the political debate right now, even in countries like Italy. No, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, wait, let me just. Re- I, I think that's such a great point, and we haven't even discussed the importance of Draghi. Yeah, huge, right? Because because uh, I look at it, and people say, "Well, look at the you know look at the narrowing." of the uh, German-Italian uh, 10-year differentials. And yeah. I said, well, that's because Draghi, and Draghi will get to me, and, and Daniel, please correct me, uh, or, or let me know if you disagree, but Draghi will get whatever he wants for Italy because he knows where all the skeletons are. And it's hard Have... to say no to him. Oh, completely. But there's another very important uh, point. Absolutely agree with you, Ira. Um, Draghi is coming to power in a moment in which uh, he has 90% of the structural reforms that the European Commission would demand already in place. The Italian economy is already in a trade surplus. Uh, the, uh, there's, a, there's a primary surplus in the, in the economy. Uh, the, pension reform has already been implemented and the administration reform has already been implemented. So Draghi only has to do one little thing, and I say this from Madrid, Spain, is he only has to point slightly, you know, uh, a little bit further to Spain to say, to look really good, huh? because, <laughs> because, because things in Spain are a complete shambles. So the only thing that he needs to do uh, is to present himself as a reformer because the reforms have already been implemented so he doesn't have to uh, spend political capital in in things like pensions and things like uh, administration and the only thing that he needs to do is to spend a lot of money wisely and I think that that is is what he is going to aim for and I think that uh, that and presenting Italy as the positive, uh, example of a recovery uh, relative to, for example, Spain is going to be a huge, huge uh, uh, element of his, of his, let's say, approach towards the rest of the Eurozone. Oh, wow. wow. I wrote that down. Spend a lot of money wisely. That, that, is, <laughs> that is a great line. I am going to use it in the blog because that is so... Absolutely, because he'll get whatever he wants. Yeah. I, it's like I said to somebody, I dare anybody in Europe to tell Draghi no. He, yeah. he buried most of the bodies, so he certainly knows where they're all buried. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. He knows, he knows the system. He knows how the European Commission works. He knows how the European Central Bank moves. And, he, more, and more importantly, he comes to uh, uh, to a country that has been so tired of a coalition that was an absolute nightmare. Where, you know, we we only see headlines, bits and pieces here and there, but people in Italy that had to endure day by day nonsense from Cinque Stelle and from the uh, from Mr. Salvini. I mean, you know, whatever. 
they need they want somebody that is going to that is going to put uh, some money to work italy did something from the very beginning of this recovery fund process that was critical is that they appointed an independent commission of entrepreneurs and uh, business leaders to uh, channel and to uh, make the requests of these funds. So they're going to be not just at the forefront, but they're going to be at the forefront with projects that at least uh, in paper make economic sense. Yeah, it's, it's and, and it, it's, you know what, Italy has done very little right if I'm going to go back to, uh, well, when they used to change uh, leadership every six months. You know, I'm going they continue to do that. <laughs> well, I, yeah, but uh, you know what, at least Mario Monte, which was a, which was, which was a plague from Brussels on the Italian people because he was pathetic. I, I understood it was a, uh, it was like in the United States with anybody but Trump, anybody but Berlusconi. <laughs> And they and they squeezed him out. Well, Mario Monti was a, a disaster, but Mario Draghi comes knowing full well how all this works, and there will be no say no to Italy. Actually, you know, Italy looks pretty good. Uh, and as much as I detest the European, the Italian banks and all European banks, but but you, you got to look at it and go, no, this was really a brilliant move on the part of the Italians. I, I really, and even uh, uh, Five Star, they, they saw the intelligence of this because, yeah. hey, it's now open, open up the floodgates because we're going to get what, the, I think Italy comes, I mean, France really moves, uh, You, it's interesting you look at Spain, I look at Italy and go, or France and go, under Macron, they're really at a loss here. Macron doesn't think so because, of course, he thinks that he's uh, he's uh, Charles de Gaulle's uh, reincarnation or his illegitimate child. But you know, he's he really thinks he's Charles de Gaulle. But they're they're adrift here, and now they're gonna they're gonna get into a, a, a what we would call here in the United States a pissing match with the Chinese. Yeah. I don't think that's a very good role to play. But the Italians really have been elevated here. No, I completely agree. And I think that that comparison relative to two, uh, two very, very important economies in the Eurozone, France and Spain, is going to make Mario, Draghi, uh, Mario Draghi's position a lot easier. I completely agree. Just coming back to the, the German approach to energy, uh, Daniel, that you mentioned earlier, do you see energy commodity prices going higher from agenda-based or government-based environmentalist policies, uh, maybe towards adversely affecting fossil fuel production and supply chain? Um, I, d I genuinely think that we will continue to see some strength in energy commodities. Uh, we have seen, we ha the, there have been short and long-term effects leading to where we are right now. The, the longer term effects have been the underinvestment that uh, actually we did discuss uh, another time uh, uh, in, this, in, this, in this chat, no? Is the underinvestment that has been going in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the energy sector for a few years now, I'm talking of since 2014. The other is obviously the base effect you know, just we've gone from a slump in demand to a rapid recovery in demand that uh, is not easily met by supply. And um, uh, environmental policies do have an impact, but I think it's more of a long term one. You have one is efficiency, which obviously efficiency is eroding an entire Sweden of demand every day, every year. Sorry. Um, and technology disinflation is there as well. But I think that uh, at least at, at least until mid year 2021, we are likely to continue to have uh, strength in energy commodities coming from the supply uh, uh, challenges. 
or the supply management coming from OPEC, both things work. And the, uh, the, the, the recovery in demand, while some of the supply chains that you mentioned have been severely compromised. So I think that that, that is likely to happen. The problem, I think, comes in the second part of the year. The second part of the year, I think that you can have a, a, a drastic move down as uh, supply starts to kick in and estimates of global demand growth start to be uh, at least trimmed. Your thoughts, Ira? Uh, you know, I, I, there's nothing I disagree with there. So I'm not, I, I think that, that there's a lot of truth. You'll see that, as Daniel points out, the investment really returned. Like in the United States, it's been mm. you know, a lot of investment pulled back from the fracking because it was just uh, ill thought out and it, you know, and it supported a lot of um, production that wound up actually you know, uh, impinging upon prices. So I think that uh, lenders into that sector are going to be much more reticent. And I think, you know, and, and this is one of the things, you know, and we talked about it quite a bit uh, over time, Rick, Richard, is that so much of the analysis is so static. You know, it's like I when I read the Mideast um, uh, foreign policy coming out of the Biden group, it's appalling because they think they're going to have their way with everybody. Oh, we're going to come down hard on the Saudis. Well, the Saudis are not going to sit there and take this. We saw yeah. this. Uh, the Saudi look, the world changed dramatically in 2016 in the fall when this when the Saudi king went to Moscow. Yeah. The world changed dramatically. And I read from these foreign policy people who are in the Biden group, and you know what? I gag on it because it's so static that I go, you think the world is going to wait for you? You yeah. think you just sanction the Saudis and the Saudis are going to go, oh yeah, thank you, sir, may I have another? <laughs> it, the world is not have. they're not going to react like that. Your models are static, just like the Fed models. Mm -hmm. It's all static. You better change your tune because the world is a far more dynamic place. And the Saudis and the Russians will do uh, more to affect energy one way or another. We've seen it both ways, by the way. Yeah. The Chinese are certainly a big player. You know, I, we in the West are busy, and this goes to Europe too, bashing the Chinese over what goes on in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. And morally, that's right. We don't know exactly what's happening there. But, and there, who's... Who's one of the biggest customers of Iranian oil? The Chinese. Hmm. Well, there are a lot of things that don't connect very well because if the Islamic issue was such a big issue, why are the Iranians doing so much business uh, with the Chinese? And Because it's always the Iranians who are projecting themselves as the linchpin of the Islamic world. And I think that's what scares the Saudis more than anything is because in order to be the linchpin of the, of the uh, Islamic world, you got to have control over Mecca and Medina. And uh, last I looked on, the, on my map, that's in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's be very careful here. And, and I have no time for everybody's static analysis. You know what? Get a little bit more dynamic. I missed the passing of uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski, who I've had my differences since I've been in graduate school going back, uh, what year is this? Uh, uh, so 40, some 45 years ago when I was reading Brzezinski, um, not necessarily on foreign policy, but on other things, totalitarianism. And, but Brzezinski really had laid a lot of this out and his recent work before he died uh, was so good at understanding what the Russians were doing and, and he was, you know, slapping, uh, Brzezinski was really critical of the West in many ways, in the way that they were approaching Russia and with the way they were, you know, thinking that, hey, this is still a containment world. The containment world is over, even though I know the Atlantic Group put out a, uh, a new longer telegram, which was kind of interesting piece in regards to China. So world is far more dynamic. Yeah. 
No, I completely agree. And I think that you've touched upon a very important thing, which is the, uh, I think that the West was extremely paternalistic and probably, and, and extremely, uh, extremely confident that the OPEC plus agreement would not work and that it would just uh, fall apart at the seams. And here we are a few years later and it's, uh, and it's working. So I think that uh, as, as consumer nations and, and it's one thing that in, in the Eurozone, they don't pay any attention to. And, uh, uh, probably in in many of the of the consumer nations as well. One of the one of the things that we need to to think about is that the the dynamic at uh, the in the producing countries is changing significantly, and they're starting to realize that they that uh, there there has been a shift in which they have gone from being. Uh, price takers and suffering the blunt of the of uh, of the slowdown in the economy to take an advantage of this supply chain uh, challenges that we have seen so I, I would pay a lot of attention to that I think that it's a, it's very very interesting to see how that OPEC plus agreement has lasted far longer and is and remains much stronger than what most uh, most polit uh, political commentators expected. Yeah, and, and that's right. And anytime anybody wants to ramp up, listen, we saw that the Obama administration made a critical error by allowing the Russians back into the Mideast mm -hmm. with, the, with, the, with the debacle about red lines. It was a debacle, and it allowed the Russians to reestablish that port uh, in the Mediterranean. In the Eastern Mediterranean has given them a foothold, and they're even dealing with the Turks. The Turks yeah. buying uh, Russian uh, anti uh, uh, air, well, buying air defense systems. From there, there are so many moving parts here, and yet all the analysis we read is so friggin' status, yeah. static, and yet that's how people invest on that static. Many, many moving parts here. This, this is not going to be as easy. You know, we already see it with China because anytime that, you know, you can, you can lash out at China, you can beat at China. China has the tripwire of playing the Taiwan card whenever they wish. And yeah. that will really get things going. So, you know what? I, again, we, you know, we keep coming to this. It comes out of Europe. It comes, but I, I would not be so quick to sanction everybody, because we first of all we see the sanctions are a joke anyway. Yeah. Yes, I know. I know the Iranian economy is is far weaker. Yeah, that's true. But once you learn, you know, we, we learned something about Cuba that the more we sanctioned Cuba, the, the stronger that economy, the underlying economy got because you you learn how to uh you, uh, you know what what is that little quote that goes uh Life isn't about, you know, worrying about the rainfall. It's learning how to dance in the rain. Yeah. And when, you, when you keep sanctioning everybody, they eventually learn to dance in the rain because mm -hmm. everybody's trying to make business wherever they can anyway. So, you know, cut it out. And you, the more you use that weapon, the less force it really has. Absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, also to that point in, in terms of sanctions, it, sanctions become a perfect justification for the existing regime to put all of the economic and social troubles of the country under the umbrella of it's because of the sanctions and perpetuate themselves in power. So, and you know, and that that obviously generates uh, even worse problems for for the population. Yeah, yeah, very good point. I just. Uh... Continuing on the supply chain issues, if we extend this discussion to other commodities and just global trade in general, um, given the supply chain disruptions due to the COVID response, Daniel, what are your thoughts on inflation? Is it is it a cyclical short-term thing or a structural long-term and, and why? Hmm. Well, I, <laughs> the problem with inflation is that usually you have to respond both is that uh, on one side you have 
the reality of the disinflationary pressures coming from technology, from aging of the population, from too much debt, all those disinflationary pressures not only remain, but were accelerated throughout COVID-19 and the crisis. I think that what is different right now is that we are seeing significant inflationary pressures in uh, non-replicable goods and services. We mentioned commodities. It's not just energy commodities. It's, it's everything that has to do with food. Uh, very, very important increase in prices of, of fresh food all over the world, particularly in emerging economies. Um, and those those are quite uh, quite concerning. Um, I think that uh, the the impact of those uh, of those supply chain uh, challenges that we talked about is relevant. I think it's more relevant uh, to think about the 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 two things about inflation. No, the first thing is that. We are seeing input prices in uh, the industrial complex coming up quite rapidly. But because we, because basically throughout the crisis, um, overcapacity has been perpetuated through massive loans, refinancing, you name it. What we are seeing is the inability of many industries of uh, being able to pass those input prices to consumers. So margins are under pressure. The other element that uh, is that uh, uh, a vast majority of of, uh, commentators are expecting a huge increase in consumption from the reopening. Uh, Part of that uh, may, may happen, but not as aggressively precisely for what I mentioned before, is that for an average household, inflationary pressures are stronger than what headline CPI shows. I'll, I'll just briefly comment, for example, on the February uh, Eurozone CPI that came out yesterday. No, uh, it was it was 0.9%, 0.9%, you know, very subdued level of uh, headline inflation. But if you look at the components, you would see that almost every component is up 1.5, 1.6%. Yet, the, the, the headline CPI is brought down by a fall in one, of 1.7% in energy. However, the way that CPI is calculated uh, is, is quite tricky because energy is considered as, a, as, as the raw material, not as what you and I uh, pay for energy. So if you include taxes and subsidies, which are huge in Europe, Um, you don't see the reduction in energy in your basket, but you do see the increase in fresh food, in uh, public services, in healthcare, in education, in rent that uh, that are significantly higher. So the point is, yes, we are seeing uh, inflationary pressures. Those will continue, and particularly in those non-replicable goods and services. I think that what we are also likely to see is that headline and official inflation will come down from uh, from the levels it will reach in June because of the base effect. The base effect works both ways, no? Yep. And, you, and your thoughts, Ira? Well, Daniel, I don't have to worry about them because both Lagarde and... Uh, Powell have told me, no, it's transitory and it's just based on the way that we calculate. So as, as the deflationary forces of last year drop out of our of our equations, of course it's going to, but that's transitory. So we've been told, don't worry about it. They all know, they know that this inflation doesn't matter. But Daniel brings up a point that is, is eating at me. I'm going to put it in that term, Daniel. And I've talked about it, Richard, uh, I think we talked about it last time with uh, maybe with the four horsemen and the, pop, <laughs> the apocalypse. But a, a keystone for me, Daniel, is to watch the Chinese yuan. Yeah. And as you and as the yuan goes higher, I make that more inflationary on on the rest of the world. It is. And here's something that the Fed because their models are devoid of international uh, money flows. And you know, was, I, I, I have argued 
for 45 years since I've been in graduate school that the Phillips curve was flawed because it didn't have a global component. Yeah. We looked at the domestic impact of wages, you know, jobs and wages. And, and I said, well, and then it certainly after 1989, when the world changed dramatically, the Berlin Wall falls, uh, the, uh, the Chinese are in full force. And then 1994, they depreciate the yuan by 50% to take them to the next step, but there's no component, uh, you know, that once you unleash this global labor force of billion, literally a, a few billion from Eastern Europe through, through uh, Asia with the Chinese leading the way, and of course all the Asian tigers, you had downward pressure on wages that were never picked up by the curve. But that's, hmm. so you had, but with the advent of China, China allowed the central banks to believe that they were, and I'm not talking about the BOJ, the, yeah. the, the Japanese were suffering true deflation, but there's mm -hmm. no other country in the world who has suffered deflation, even if, if we've gone on the march of quantitative ease. It was all in the anticipation of heading off deflation, right? This was this was classic Bernanke, his his work in the 30s and especially 1937. So, we, but we never got to that deflation. But there were, as Paul says, disinflationary forces. Well, the key disinflationary force in the world was, of course, China, with its huge amount of capacity that it brought onto the world and kept prices down, especially wages more than controlled. They were downward pressure on wages, which is why you've had the inequality, uh, and that was actually captured very well. Sorry, Daniel, but by Thomas uh, Picotti, yeah, uh, with R being greater than G. I mean, to simplify it, what Picotti was, yeah, he saw it in its full exposure. So we've had we've had all of that, and and that was the Chinese. But when I watched the yuan, because I've watched commodity prices defy economic reality, according to uh, many sources. As we've seen over, especially over the last eight months, after the what I would call the uh, March April dip of, of 2020, when commodity prices and the blue, I'm, I'll use the Bloomberg Commodity Index in this regard dropped dramatically, uh, uh, we've seen quite a rebound, and yet the global economy has not nearly been in step with what prices are. But at the same time, the yuan has been rallying, strengthening, let me put it in that way, you want us to strengthen. So that told me, or I perceive and conjecture, therefore, that somebody's been stockpiling a lot of raw materials. Yeah. And that somebody has to be China because, and, and, it, and it's interesting because I've been, uh, I sold my house, uh, busy packing, or I was I'm back in Arizona now, uh, but I just came back. But I found an old uh, magazine that I had kept from June of 2007, the Far Eastern Economic Review, which is really a very good journal. And I kept it because my son had a, uh, a book review in here about Japan. He's a Japan expert. But the cover story, the lead story, this is from June of 2007, China's last option, let the Yuan soar, and it was written by one of my favorite economists, I don't know how you feel about him, Michael Pettis, mm -hmm. who I think is one of the smartest and most intelligent sources on China. So I'm looking at it, and if China is doing what I think they're doing, which is what Pettis has advised for years and years and years, which is shifting to a much more domestic consumption-based economy than an export, not that they're still not major exporters, I'm not saying that, yeah. but if you want to enrich your middle class you want your currency to appreciate because then all the things you need to buy to sustain your your uh, middle class consumer, you import. Yeah. Well, a stronger currency, as as Germany will certainly show us, keeps prices under control and enriches your middle class. So if this scenario, if this conjecture is right, I think the yuan is going to go test. Uh, we're at six. Where are we at? We're at six point five low today. I think it, it, we will go to six and a quarter to test that, and we'll in 
I would, in, I, I, have, I don't forecast time periods, but I think we'll go and we'll test that January 1st, 1994 level of 5.8. That will be a critical test, but this will all be done with China pivoting to a more domestic consumption. And that will bring to bear a major rise in global prices because the Chinese will not be flooding the, glo the global system with its excess capacity. It'll be using it to, to aid and abet its own middle class further development. That's a, that is a great, great, great point. I would add to it, which I completely agree with, I would add to it that um, Chinese official unemployment is at 5.5%. Um, youth unemployment is 13%. Uh, so there's one thing that China cannot do right now is uh, to uh, aim at constantly depreciating the currency. What they need to do is to strengthen disposable income. Hmm? And the only way in which you, after a recovery like the one that China has had in 2020 and expected in 2021, the only way in which you bring that level of unemployment to three and 10 um, is, is with internal consumption, is by boosting internal demand significantly. Because as you know, uh, I read, uh, I read in a report about China that 60% of small and medium enterprises in China are working at 60% capacity. So basically what you need to do is, is get the consumer internally to buy from the small and medium enterprises and, to, and that will boost uh, job creation. And obviously you cannot do that by going constantly down the, the Argentina way of, of depreciating the currency. So I think that uh, that is an interesting factor because globally, central banks look at disinflationary pressures uh, using, uh, using their perception of, uh, of what is going to come from imported goods and services. But if imported goods and services start to go up in price, then there is a significant inflationary pressure that we had not been thinking about in the past five years. Yes, you know what? And, and, and when I listen to Powell tell me that he's, that, oh, well, the disinflationary forces will contain, he didn't say this yesterday, interestingly, but he is, you know, when he testified before Congress, uh, and he's speaking uh, probably right now, I think, uh, 11 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, so uh, these disinflationary forces, now I know that Indian exists, India exists out there, hmm. and that will come to play but it's not here now. And you are gonna get blindsided if you think that in your limited modeling that the same global disinflationary forces are gonna be at play here. I would be very careful and very, and, and I think some of what the action in the bond market is telling you that, you know, mm, well, we, yeah. we haven't gotten to that discussion. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait that because uh, we wanna discuss uh, the Fed and. So where, yeah, where they're going there, but I but I think that point, Daniel, is I, I think this is a very important theme that is going to play out. Yeah, in, in terms of central yeah. bank policies from from a major central bank point of view, uh, Daniel, do, do you think uh, or what are your views on a financial system that is structurally levered to support appreciated asset prices? Is that more important to central bank policies than containing inflation? Oh, certainly it is. You know, central banks always do the same thing. You know, first they say that there's no inflation, then they say that it's transitory, and then they say that it's uh, that it's because of uh, the evil uh, decisions of uh, business owners or of the Chinese. Huh? So don't don't uh, so don't worry about that. Um, and as, as Ira was saying, both Lagarde and Powell have told me not to worry. So. So I shouldn't uh, uh, joke, but um, I think that uh, central bank policy right now is is uh, is 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 impossible to change, hmm? and the reason why it's impossible to change is because we have already seen what it was called the rate tantrum, which is is not even the rate hangover, um, show how little. Uh, 
capacity does uh, the average central bank have to accept that in a rising uh, GDP growth with normalized uh, uh, rise in, in inflation, bond yields are going to rise, no? Mm -hmm. um, which shows how structurally uh, leveraged to the theme of low inflation, high liquidity, low rates, the market is no mm -hmm. so i think that central banks will pay a lot more attention to bond yields and to uh, the 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 response from markets rather than the uh, the creeping uh, rising uh, uh, prices that we see and your thoughts ira I, I agree and they're always pointing at somebody but now that the market is you know and again um, Powell does not want to admit it, but he's up against it because when you have um, Buffett and Dalio and Druckenmiller and Gunlatch and on and on and Kovner and some of the great global macro titans going, hey, I'm going to, the bonds are, are not just, they're a male investment. And now I, you know, I, with uh, Rosenberg, with you, uh, Richard, and I, who I respect immensely, and I'm great, and I'm, a, and he's been right for for a long time, and I, and but we are now hitting a point in the same year. I feel about Lacey Hunt, one of the, what Lacey Hunt, one of the great uh, bond minds ever. He, he's just great. He under and the way he approaches bond market, but we. Right now, the market is calling a lot of these people out, and there's some people sitting on some very ugly returns, by the way. There's nothing free here. And I, I will add to this that, you know, the Fed's pretty smug here, thinking that they're, they're going to control this, especially because one of the big players, you know, everybody's talking about the convexity trades, and those are, of course, significantly important, and we have that going on. But Part of the convexity world, of course, is those who have to hedge their bond portfolio exposure. Well, we know that the world's largest single bondholder, meaning the Fed balance sheet, they don't hedge. So the bonds are doing what they're doing with one of the most dynamic uh, players or, or potentially, well, now they become static, but one of the greatest dynamic missing from the marketplace. So if I'm in the Fed, I'm even more worried because I don't play in this arena, and yet they're pushing at it pretty good. So they're, the market's trying to force the Fed's hand with yield curve control. We're going back to 1946 to 1951. Um, I don't see I don't see a way around it. Or the market is going what the market is going to do, and we'll find out. And Steve Leisman really was on top of this and asked the question. Of course, Powell danced it as good as Mario Draghi ever danced a question. He must have been taking uh, uh, magician lessons from uh, Mario. Uh, but he, they will push the market to, to, as I was talking with somebody this morning, to a level that reflect historical real rates of return on long-term debt. So it used to be, you know, for years and years that if the 10-year uh, yielded uh, a real rate of return, so uh, not nominal rates, but real rates of, of positive 2%, that would take us to the 10 year to about, uh, I'm gonna use the Fed numbers, to three and a half to, to, to 4% in order to get those levels. And if the Fed's not gonna do anything to stop it, watch what the market does to demand what they're going to want for return on all this borrowing being done by sovereign governments. Mm -hmm. Completely agree, yeah. Uh, just a final question on uh, cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currencies. Uh, you mentioned recently to beware of CBDCs. Daniel, can you elaborate on that? And do, do you see the um, the allowance or, or um, governments to allow private-based cryptocurrencies to coexist along, alongside government-based cryptocurrencies. Um, well, the the 
the idea, well, the project of digital currencies from central banks is going to be going uh, and it's going to be moving forward no matter what. Hmm? I think that it, in any case, misses the point. Uh, and, uh, and it misses the point because the, the, the idea behind these uh, central bank digital currencies is to increase the level of control that the central bank uh, has on uh, transactions and, uh, and it's uh, also a way to try to compete with uh, cryptocurrencies. But I don't think that one asset has anything to do with the other. The uh, citizens all over the world that look for cryptocurrencies are basically looking for an asset that, uh, that goes up more than inflation and that reduces the, uh, the, reduces the risk of uh, losing uh, purchasing power of their own currency. For us, either in the Eurozone or in the, in the United States um, or in Canada, we see cryptocurrencies as a, as a volatile and as a, uh, well, uh, and as, an, and as a financial asset. But think about it from the perspective of an Argentine citizen that has seen the Argentine peso lose 98% of its purchasing power in the last 10 years relative to the US dollar. Or... Uh, when the you know the Brazilian real or the Mexican peso or the uh, or, or so many currencies out there, I think that what we it's very very difficult to believe that any of those central banks in those countries are going to generate any incremental demand for their currency by going digital. In the case of the European Union of the Eurozone and the United States, the project to implement the digital currency is unstoppable. I think it's completely unstoppable because I think that they, there, there are two elements there. One is what Ira was mentioning before, is to try to prevent China from making the UN a world reserve currency. The second is obviously to try to compete with cryptocurrencies within the market. And I think that in any case, governments and central banks, they don't they like the monopoly of make of of creating money. They don't like uh, competition there and they will try to do anything to stop the uh, stop cryptocurrencies, independent cryptocurrencies from becoming uh, a generalized mean of payment. Interesting. And your thoughts, Ira? Bingo, bingo. I agree totally. Yeah. And see, I, and I think that the Chinese, you know, I don't know where Dan, maybe we talked about it last time, but it, when the Chinese come with their crypto, which is also an answer to the uh, silliness of the sanctions, by the way. Yes, I understand the SWIFT system and I understand the US ability, but as people, people don't sit there and say, you know, yeah, oh yeah, the United States wants this, I'm just gonna wait for you world doesn't work that way, never has, never has. So they're looking for ways around it. Now, if I'm a, uh, an oligarch or I'm a Chinese uh, extremely wealthy person and I'm trying to circumvent some of the things that they're sanctioning for, I'm gonna put some money into crypto, right? And it's more because of the blockchain. But uh, Daniel is right and I'll say it, it says it in the US constitution and and every government in the world throughout history does not like competition when it comes to their currency. That's, a, that's the act of a sovereign. Now in the in forming the Euro, uh, well, the Germans thought it was gonna be, of course, a, uh, a Deutschmark and everybody else thought it was gonna be a French franc or a lira. I won't say the French franc because under uh, Trichet, the policy of uh, the Fort Franc was squeezed the hell out of uh, the French middle, middle class, but hmm. what they thought it would be an Italian lira or a Spanish peseta. So there's always been a difference. But when you surrendered that sovereignty, uh, which you did by becoming part of uh, the Euro, well, they did it backwards, of course, because you, first you're supposed to do, you're supposed to have uh, harmonized fiscal policy, but they figured they that wouldn't go well. So they did the currency first and put it in everybody's hand kind of force everybody into that situation. But but you do not like competition. 
That's my only problem with a Bitcoin. You, we will be in a world of some type of cryptocurrency. But if the Chinese are truly looking for reserve status, they will make it backed by gold and silver. Silver would be a, a, a payback for, of course, the opium wars and Britain's efforts to appreciate and devalue the uh, Chinese economy because the Chinese economy was based on uh, silver. So we know what took place. So if the Chinese come up with a crypto, make it somewhat backed by gold and silver, and they will gain immediate international status. Now it doesn't have to be one to one like the you know, you you set it on some. In today's world, if you did it, probably uh, if it was ten percent backed by uh, a precious metal, everybody in the world would desire it because at least it would have something behind it besides uh, uh, ink. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I, you know, but I, I agree with that because the U.S. Constitution says that uh, Article One, Section Eight, Paragraph Five about the role of uh, the U.S. government when it comes to currency. Mm -hmm. So, it's here and it's here for a reason because of mistakes that are being made. I think uh, regularly. I think Daniel absolutely is is right about that and how we see it finish play out i don't know but it won't be an sdr i i know that mm -hmm. uh, well yeah. it's been great insight and discussion gentlemen how can our listeners learn more about your work daniel Oh, well, uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter. It's uh, at uh, D-L-A-C-A-L-L-E -L -L -E underscore I-A. You can find me on my YouTube channel, uh, Daniel Lacay in English. Or uh, you can find me in my website. Uh, it's not difficult to find me. Just write Daniel Lacay and, and you'll be bombarded by, by boredom. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that's not true. I go to his YouTubes. Very good. Yeah. And Ira. Well, I'm still, you know, uh, I haven't written, but I, I'm hoping to write tonight. This will get me going uh, notes from underground. Uh, and I'm doing, a, you know, again, a lot of podcasts with you, Richard. And of course, um, Anthony Credelli and I go on uh, White Wave and I go to uh, the PAX group. So where I sit in chat rooms, which are really good. And, it, and it, uh, we get to hash out and thrash out good investable ideas because again, I think what Daniel and I both bring is we bring actionable ideas and I'm going to, you know, I'm just so enamored with the uh, line from the uh, Deng Xiaoping administration and the way that Deng moved China off of uh, Maoism, which was to, to, to use this as the measure. Practice, practice is the sole criterion for judging truth. That's me. That's what I strive to do, to make everything actionable and not just gibberish theoretical, to, to put theory to practice. And if we do it well, we'll find very profitable investments. Yes, exactly. Words of wisdom. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Daniel and Ira. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Have a great Daniel, day. Daniel, this was great. You know, we really thrash out some ideas. I, I got to go back to think about some things and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I really I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Pleasure for me. Same here. Have a great day. Great. Okay. Thank you. Take care. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.